good this C63 Coupe is. Hey guys, welcome back to RBR and to our first ever foray into the awesome sports car manufacturer that is Porsche. And I really wanted to do this correctly. So we are gonna start off with the car that is perhaps the least likely to ever hold a Porsche badge. And then in the next couple of videos, work our way up to the original, the brand new 992-911. But today we're starting with this car. Now, this is no ordinary Panamera. This particular Panamera is actually a bit of a celebrity in our automotive reviewing world. Now the Porsche press guys have given it a rather amusing name. He's called Ron, as in Burgundy. I'm Ron Burgundy. Obviously. You stay classy. Pun intended. But this car is quite special. It's actually already been tamed by the legend Chris Harris himself. If I had a hat, I would take it off in respect. And it's also been on the big shows at BBC and Amazon and used for various things. The thing I found most impressive was that this wagon was used for tracking super and hypercars because it's one of the few things in the world that you can hang out the back of, still be dynamic and keep up with a hypercar. Fascinating. And the car that we are tackling today is called the Porsche Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid Sport Turismo. Yes, you best take a breath before trying to tackle that one. And it's been described by Porsche's head of powertrains, Arno Bogle, as a 918 for the family. And that kind of gives away what lies behind the skin of this car. It is, of course, a V8 paired with electric motors. But before we get into all of that, you guys know I love to tell the story of a car. And like every good Porsche, the Panamera has quite the story to tell. Now, you see, you might think that the first time Porsche considered doing a four-door was the Ugly Duckling, the original Cayenne. Now, I hesitate to call it a Cayenne because it didn't really look like a Cayenne. It looked more like what it was based on, which was the Touareg. But this, to Porsche's credit, was not the first ever four-door that they imagined as a more practical car for their customers. You see, the first one was actually back in 1988, and it was the Porsche 989 concept. Now that's gonna look a lot more familiar to you. This was a four-door car that was actually designed by Ulrich Bez to be a competitor for S-Class in seven series. And it looks very much like a stretched 911, doesn't it? I mean, if anything, it looks a bit more Porsche than even our current Panamera. But of course it hasn't got allowance for big air, air intakes, etc. But generally that roof line and everything looks very similar to the second gen Panamera that we have now. Now this car also was a V8 in the front, driving power to the rear wheels. So very similar to the car that we eventually ended up with. And the only reason that car wasn't made was the recession that hit Porsche like the rest of the world back then. In fact, there was a car that looked quite similar to the car that we're looking at today. And that was a stretch 928 that Porsche made at one point as a, as a study. And it's even in a similar color to the car here. And you can see it's got kind of like Mazda RX-8 type doors in the rear. But it's quite nice to see how the actual rear of the car is quite similar with what we ended up with. But then of course, eventually in 2009, we did get the original Panamera. Now, this car, it insulted the purists as everything seems to do anyway. But it was an absolute sales success. But the handling, the dynamics, the great interior and the desirability of a Porsche were facts that nobody could get away from. But the design, the design was ugly and it needed seeing to. So in 2012, Porsche debuted the Sport Turismo Panamera concept. And if that looks familiar, it's because it's nigh on identical to what we eventually ended up with. What a absolutely stunning looking car. It has so much more Porsche DNA from 991 in it. And of course we eventually ended up with a lot of that in the final car which is great. But a year prior to this in 2011, Porsche were given the responsibility by VAR Group to create a platform for Panamera size cars that would be used across the group. And that platform is called the MSB platform. And it debuted for the first time in the Panamera itself. And how awesome does the new Panamera look compared to the original version? It has transformed from ugly duckling into one of the best looking saloons in my opinion. And you would be forgiven 
when you see the rear of this car passing you for thinking that it was a 991. That's how sexy this car looks to me, certainly. But today, we are looking, of course, at the Sport Turismo, which, of course, means either estate or wagon. It is still an unlikely Porsche, but I think it's one that petrol heads are more readily willing to accept because we all really love fast, stupid wagons. So let's have a look first at the design of this car. Now, as I said, a lot of it links back to that Sport Turismo concept, which is great because we all really, really loved it. And you see that straight away, not only in the shape, but in the lights of the new Panamera across the range. They are just like in the concept and they look absolutely gorgeous. I love the light design inside. It's really given the Panamera a signature look. You've of course got very large front intakes to cool the V8 sitting behind there, which is absolutely key for a car of this power. But the front end is so, so big. It is really wide. And that is something that we will discuss later in terms of usability. But it does give this car a very intimidating presence compared to say S-Class or other cars of that ilk. But generally the sculpture of the bonnet and the entire composition of the front end to me looks a lot more Porsche than the previous generation did. And as you come to the side, you see it kind of slims down in the middle and you end up then with a Coke bottle design very much like the 911 on the rear, even in this Sport Turismo, which is great to see because you want to invoke 911, I feel, in every single Porsche. Wing mirrors, again, very similar to the two-door cars. The only bit that isn't is the side wing here behind the front wheel arch. You'll see the car sits on huge 21-inch alloys and behind that are some of the biggest brake calipers I've ever seen. You do get CCBs, carbon ceramic brakes, as standard on this hybrid turbo. And then you'll notice the acid green highlights across the car. And this is to make it very obvious to you that this is a hybrid. The rear, however, is undoubtedly my favorite part of this car. Just the way that it tapers off and you have the little spoiler that rises from the back and the general 911 shape. And not only that, the sculptured lights now on the back of the Panamera, as started by the Macan, just look absolutely gorgeous. And the Porsche writing inside, again, it mimics what we now have in 992. And I love how little space there is between the top of the real wheel arch and the window line itself. It just shows you how aggressive this car looks from the rear. The rear is undoubtedly my favorite part of this car. And then of course you've got the quad pipes in the rear, the rear looking very, very wide and very, very aggressive. And you'll see that when the car is on the road later on. But now we must get onto the drivetrain. Now we know that this is a hybrid drivetrain. So it has a V8 four liter under here producing 542 brake horsepower on its own. And between that engine and the eight speed PDK gearbox lies an electric motor that produces another 134 brake horsepower, altogether giving you 671 brake and 850 Newton meters of torque in this car. But there is a penalty to having the system in this car. And one of the penalties is an extra 215 kg, which is a lot of weight added to this. And again, we'll see how that affects things later. You also lose a bit of boot space, about 95 liters in the boot as well. But that is not the end of the story as far as four doors go for Porsche or indeed saloon cars. We know that the Porsche Taycan is coming based on that Mission E concept. And it is a smaller brother to the Panamera, but it's all electric. So it's gonna be fascinating to see how that lines up compare to the, compared to the elder Panamera. But you see, things have also changed a little bit this year in terms of rivals for the Panamera as well with the coming of the AMG GT four-door. But you see, I don't see the GT four-door as a rival for the Panamera. I've always said this. The GT four-door is meant to be a four-door alternative to the AMG GTR, hardcore, uncompromising and that car really is but the Panamera has always been considered internally more of a rival to S-Class a luxurious car but far far more dynamic than the S-Class or the 7 series could manage Porsche don't have the luxury that AMG do of having a plethora of luxury cars standing behind the GT to fulfill that niche no the Panamera has to have breadth of ability and as you'll see later, that's exactly what this car has. It is the poster boy for breadth of ability. 
But now let's go inside, let's have a look at the awesome new interior in the second gen Panamera before we take the car out for a drive. So welcome to the second generation Panamera interior. And for Porsche, it's a really, really important interior because since then, each of their cars has been heavily based upon this structure. And what an awesome structure to be based on because this is just one of the best looking interiors in the world. And there's two things in particular that I love about Porsche interiors in general. One is the symmetry of everything. Everything is so beautifully symmetrical. The second thing is simplicity of design. And one of the most controversial things in the new Panamera is this new center console. So if I turn the car on in the ignition, I love the touch when the air vents open up here. That's a really nice little touch. But then you see the center console lights up and then you get all your options. And initially it looks very confusing. But once you get to using it, and I've been using this car for about a week, it's very, very simple to use. And it's so great how when you turn the car off, all of these options disappear and all you're left with is like a black blank plane of glass. But when you turn it on, then you get all of those options. It's a little bit similar, I guess, to the AMG GT4 door that you have the new digital buttons in the middle and when you turn it on, that's the only time you see the options. But of course, this was started with Panamera. And what I found while using it is, it's, as I said, it's very simple. So you've got all your navigation bits at the top, then you've got climate control, and then you've got all of your drive modes. That's it, it's not more complicated than that. So in your drive modes, of course, you've got your typical gear stalk here, which is great that Porsche keep this in the middle. I love that. You've got individual mode here, which you can, of course, set up in the system, which we'll get to. You've got your suspension and traction control off as well, and your handbrake. Now, the driver zone is the area that I always like to start with because as your connection to the driver, of course, it's the main thing. And this Porsche driver zone is fantastic. Let's start with the steering wheel. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but this steering wheel originated from the 918 Spider. So it came from that hypercar, then trickled down into the Macan and then every other car since then. So the origins of this steering wheel design is from that. And it's one of the best steering wheel designs, in my opinion, in the world. I love how small diameter it is. It's not flat bottom, but because of the size of it, it doesn't really need to be. The controls are very easy to use in terms of navigating the hybrid analog and digital driver zone, which I absolutely love and I'll get onto in a second. And then you've got the drive select here on the side, which is a bit different you'll notice in this Turbo SE Hybrid because you've got two different modes that you wouldn't see normally. We've got E for full electric mode, Hybrid Auto, which is gonna be the main one you use and we'll get onto that later, and then Sport and Sport Plus. But as I've said in my AMG reviews, I love having this thing here. It keeps things safe and easy to use while you're driving then we must address the driver zone. I absolutely love the way Porsche do driving driver zones because you're either of two camps, either you like digital driver zones or you like analog driver zones. Rather than choosing between the fork in the road, Porsche have literally gone now the middle route and stuck an analog dial in the middle and two digital ones on the sides. Now you can change these digital dials into like your navigation maps and any other information that you want and there's a lot of information that you can get, I'll show you some of it now, for this hybrid specifically in terms of energy levels and power in the all wheel drive system, etc. But in general use, when you've just got the round dials, it actually looks exactly the same as your analog dial in the middle. And I've surprised some of my passengers showing them the maps, for example, and then they said, oh wow, this is actually a digital screen. So it's nice how you can switch between that feeling in here. And then of course you notice the acid green highlights, even inside the driver's zone, telling you that this car is a hybrid, but it's kind of hard to ignore that and I'll show you when you turn the car on later on. Then we come to this new system by Porsche in terms of the car's infotainment system. I've tried a lot of new infotainment systems recently, some I've really gotten along with, some I haven't. The ones I haven't gotten along with, generally speaking, have been the full touchscreen systems. Now, Porsche's one is actually really easy to use. And the good thing is, although it is touchscreen, you've still got a navigation knob over here, which is great because you don't all the time want to be doing this. But the good thing about this system is it's very intuitive. So you've got all your navigation bits on the right-hand side, and then your main information comes on the left. And that's really all there is to it in every single menu. So you can dive into this once you understand that basic principle very easily and find pretty much anything you're looking for. 
The other good thing that I really like in this car, and I wish more manufacturers would do it, is when you plug in your iPhone or your Android phone and you activate Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you only get it on half of the screen. So I'm gonna show you that now when I plug my phone in. So I have now plugged in my iPhone and we've got Apple CarPlay now appear on the system. But as you can see, it's only on half of the screen. I still get my very important driving modes on the left-hand side here and the rest of the Porsche navigation on the right. So it keeps that section alive, which you just don't get in other cars, which is such a shame. And I love the fact that that's been done in Porsche's new system. So good job on that. You can also set shortcuts and stuff on your main page here. The guys at Porsche already know me very well and they've set sport exhaust system there and on the shortcut that you can have on this diamond shape on the steering wheel. And for this hybrid car in particular, we've got the options for hybrid, here for the hybrid auto mode that you can change. Now you also notice you've got your Sport Chrono watch here on the top of the dashboard. And in terms of just generally the interior, the fit and finish of all of Porsche's interiors are some of the best in the world. There's just some way that they manage to build things so tightly that you hardly have any gaps. The leather work is absolutely perfect. It's Germanic detail. And it's just something that the other manufacturers and even the Germans just can't quite get close to. Now, driving position. You can sit really, really low in Panamera. I normally sit very low in cars in terms of just trying to get to the middle of the weight of the car, but even I can't sit as low as these seats will go. So if you're tall, you're gonna be very happy. You can really get comfortable inside this car. Individual mode gives you the ability to change your air spring height, the harshness of the suspension, whether you're keeping the sports exhaust on or off, and whether your spoiler is up and down, and of course, whatever mode the gearbox is in. Now jumping in the back, the first thing that you'll notice in this Sport Turismo compared to the normal Panamera is you get a fifth seat. Now it's a bit of an occasional fifth seat because you've still got this center console stack here and there's no real padding like you've got proper seats on both sides here. So it looks much more for like kids or very slim and small people because this is a lot harder than these. But it's great to still have that as a practicality thing for the Sport Turismo because a wagon you're really looking for that extra practicality and a bit of the style. Now, the other good thing about the Sport Turismo is lots of head height, because you've got a much bigger rear end here. And when you've got the big panoramic roof as well, loads of height. I'm 5'10 and I'm really, really comfortable in this car in the back. Now, as we always do, because this is a performance car, I want to show you what it sounds like, but I'm not going to do that in the mode it defaults in, which is E, we'll do that later. Let's start the car up in Sport Plus with everything on and see what it sounds like. It's not really the most exciting startup in the world for a big V8 engine. It sounds okay, but I don't think that this is what this car is really aiming for. We'll give it some revs as well in Sport Plus. So it doesn't really sound like much when revving. And again, I don't really think that's what this car is aiming for. But anyway, let's now get to our filming studio because I want to show you the other main mode that it starts up in and how this car handles for a car its size. So the first and very strange thing in this turbo hybrid happens as soon as you turn the key. So this is a 670 brake horsepower car, as we said, and the startup sounds like this by default. That's it. You get an EV Prius type bleep, and that's about it. Which is bizarre when you think that this is a car from Porsche. You see the badge, you know the figures, 670 brake, 850 Newton meters, and that's what it sounds like on default. Because the default mode that this car starts up with is E for eco or electric. So that is completely running on the electric powertrain at the moment. So we're gonna start in that mode and I wanna show you how, just how bizarre it is to take off in a Porsche in E mode. And here we go, we are at the moment, as you can see on the dial in front, completely on E power. Now E will run for about 30 miles, or 30 minutes I guess, but it takes six hours to charge up and it takes about two and a half to use the seven kilowatt charger that is supplied with it. So that's really not the point of this car. The point of this turbo hybrid is that hybrid section. That is the key word 
in this car. And funnily enough, that's the name of our next motor which I'm going to go into now, so I'm going to switch this over to H. Now H is the most clever mode that this car has. It decides which power to use at the best time depending on how you're driving and even on your navigation. So at the moment I'm in e-power, just a little click on the accelerator and the V8 comes alive. And it really is completely indiscernible in the way it does it. You will only know by either hearing the sports exhaust or seeing things change in the rev counter in front. And then you've got Sport and Sport Plus. I'm going to put it into Sport Plus and these give you full use of the V8 and the petrol engine. The car goes into full attack mode. You feel the suspension tighten up, the steering becomes that much more firm. The eight-speed box shifts quicker. And speaking of quick, the zero to 60 in this car is 3.4 seconds. And it's then that you discern the massive 850 Newton meters of torque. But it's funny, this car doesn't actually have a torque curve because of the electric motor from 1400 to 5600 revs. It's a torque line because you get that complete power throughout and it's bizarre because it's more like an EV within those ranges in terms of the power that is delivered to you and it makes it unique to all the other Panameras. Now those modes are great for a bit of emotion but my favourite is the intelligent hybrid mode with the exhaust turned on because it gives you the best of both worlds. But when you do need a little bit more power out of this car, there is a special mode in this that I really love and it's hidden here within the drive selecting tool is the button in the middle and it's called sports response mode and what it does it gives you full attack power for 20 seconds with a timer on the front there and it's so unnecessary but it's one of the coolest things I've seen on a car and I've used it so so much and a dead giveaway if you ever seen a Panamera at the lights when the spoiler rises as I'll do now you know that the car's gone into sport response mode and then you get full attack mode for those 20 seconds and you can use it again and again whenever you need to. Completely unnecessary, but so, so cool. But it's at this point when you're calling for all the power in sport response and you expect a massive kick of Turbo S enjoyment that the car doesn't quite live to your expectations. With a name like Turbo S, you expect the car to give you brain-blending acceleration, masses of power, a big push, and a lot of oral excitement. But the Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid just doesn't do that. It picks up speed, sure, but it doesn't really push you into, back of the, into the back of your seat. A lot of that is going to be because of the 215 kg weight problem. Now, it feels mega fast, sure, but it does it in a much more executive way that you're almost left wondering, am I driving a car that is almost 700 brake horsepower. And in terms of sound, if I put it back into Sport Plus, it's okay. It's not a very orally exciting car. It, it does sound powerful because of course there's a V8 there, but it's very, very much in the distance, much more like an executive car. It hasn't got the brutal force and the amazing sound of the E63. Forget the AMG GT four door. As we said, this is really not to that level of dynamism or a supercar like that car is. And that's because Porsche had a specific goal for this car. And it was a trinity between comfort, efficiency, and performance. And that is pretty much the key to this turbo hybrid. Now the dynamics are really interesting in this car. As we said, you've got a 215 kg weight penalty that this car needs to deal with. And what Porsche have done They've thrown every acronym that they have into this car. And what I mean by that is all those different systems. So stuff like PASM, uh, Porsche Active Stability Management, Porsche Torque Vectoring, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, and even Active Aerodynamics. The only option left out that you have to option yourself is rear wheel steering. And you must absolutely do it because as we've seen in other cars of this ilk and size, it really helps larger cars shrink when you're doing smaller turns, essentially shortening the wheelbase. And with a five meter long odd thing, it's an absolute, absolute must for you guys to option. Now what is the effect of all those systems with the rear wheel steering? Well, since we're on steering, let's talk about that first. Um, the rear wheel steer is brilliant, makes you feel like you're driving a much smaller car, but the feedback you get through the wheel isn't great, really. I wish that you felt a little bit more of where the wheels were. 
That is made up by the rear wheel steer, I think, but it's not only that, the car corner is really quite flat and there's hardly any discernibility of body roll. It really feels like a much smaller car and I think the rear wheel steer helps a lot, but all of those systems coming into play, making this car more rigid, really help. You've got three, two, five cross-section rear tires, which are huge and helps with the grip. This is an S-Class size competitor car. And if I compare it to S63 in terms of dynamics, it really knocks spots off that car. I love how it shrinks. You just don't think that you're driving something so large. Rather than the speed, rather than the horsepower or the torque, this is the point I feel where this car becomes really special, where you discern what a heavy thing it is, but how brilliantly it shrinks and handles. I just wish though it had the oral character to match the handling dynamism. Now there is a GTS which is more sharp, more dynamic, and it's a bit weird because you expect the Turbo S to be the king of dynamism, but that's not quite how it works. The GTS is actually the stiffer, more dynamic handling car, and in fact it's probably gonna sound a little bit better as well. But honestly, I wanna stress this for a car that is much heavier than E63, heavier than S63, this is pretty damn impressive the way it handles. Now let's get it back into hybrid. I wanna talk about the daily usability of this car because where this thing really shines is being a epic Grand Tourer and it really is. Now whether you want to or not, the fact is that we can switch the car into e-power mode as we are now and you can do short trips in this car without accessing the petrol engine at all in complete Tesla Prius mode in something called Turbo S. That's insane. The other thing that makes a really great Grand Tourer is the three camber active air suspension. And that is where this car, when you're driving it normally in hybrid mode, it just becomes an S-Class rival. And that's, I keep coming back to the S-Class because that's kind of where I see this car destroying its rivals. It's that ilk of car where Porsche made something that is as luxurious as those cars, but so much more dynamic. And it's just as comfortable. It, you rarely find anything that can really unhinge this car. It's just so brilliant at chewing up miles and complete comfort. Now, hybrid mode takes the daily usability to the next level. And if you put your routes into navigation, even if it's ones that you do all the time and you know the route, it will figure out how to use what power at what time, depending on the turns and the elevations, etc., to get you even better fuel consumption. This is not a gimmick, this actually works. You can get 10 to 20% better fuel consumption by doing just that. Hence ticking the box of that efficiency side. So we've ticked comfort with the air suspension, we're ticking efficiency with the hybrid element of this car. One niggle I have with it is it is absolutely ginormous. It's a really, really wide car. Now you do get used to this and 360 camera is an absolute lifesaver but it is a very intimidatingly wide car. The other side of it is the brakes, if I brake now, they're quite mushy. And I'm wondering whether that is the carbon ceramic element, which are standard in this turbo hybrid. Um, there's just not a lot of great feel in there. And I've heard that the, the petrol versions have better feel on the brakes. Now, one other area that you must be aware of in this car being a hybrid is the battery and it's not something that you'd have to deal with in a petrol Panamera. You have to make sure that that is charged. So either you're going to be charging it in evenings or you're going to be using the hybrid function in hybrid mode here. Either you've got e-charge which draws on further power from the engine making your fuel consumption worse but charges up the battery or you've got e-hold which holds the battery at that level for you to use closer to your destination. So this is an area that would be alien to someone who hasn't used an EV, not used to charging. That's something that you do have to get used to keeping in mind when you're driving the turbo hybrid. So to conclude, this car is really a harbinger of the future, especially for Porsche, just to show how well they can integrate electric systems into their current lineup, specifically for performance and other gains. And those other gains is what we discussed before, the goal of this car, the trinity of comfort, efficiency, and performance. And the Panamera Turbo does all three to a very high level. You've got the efficiency side down thanks to the extremely clever hybrid mode. You've got the comfort side that is S-Class rivaling, and the performance, well, the figures speak for that themselves. But 
that latter one, the performance, is where our expectations of this car are not met because of that name, Turbo S. You just expect more boom, more bang out of this car. You want more noise, you want more force and acceleration, you want less of a clinical feel. Yes, this is no GTS, but being Turbo S and being the most expensive, you assume that it's just gonna have the best of everything. And that's our own fault perhaps, because we're assuming given its name that it's gonna do that. And that's perhaps where the naming of this car fails, because it confuses people. Rightly so, looking at Turbo S, we assume the best of the best in terms of performance. Perhaps if this car was called instead, perhaps, I don't know, Hybrid S, it would manage the expectations of drivers a little bit better. We know soon that the Porsche Taycan and the Porsche Taycan Cross Turismo are going to be unveiled as a smaller full electric version of this car and we've also just heard that the next gen Porsche Macan is going to be completely electric as well. So we're going to be able to soon explore a Porsche that is completely electric. And for me as a petrolhead, it's really heartening to see what is probably the prime sports car manufacturer of the world tackling this demon of all electric cars that is haunting petrol heads. If there's anyone out there who we should hold hope will crack that formula, surely it's got to be Porsche. So guys, thank you so much for watching this review of the Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid Sport Turismo. Oh my God. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, remember soon we've got the 992 review coming up as well so please do like and share this video and I'll see you again soon.